Uh, so if you haven't uh, joined us before, welcome. Um, I'm actually not Kristen Kirkwood. My name is Jackie Kane. I work for the Hartford Land Trust, um, just using Kristen's sign in this evening. Uh, she's unable to attend. Uh, but we want to thank you all for coming out tonight. Uh, my uh, partner and co-presenter tonight is Craig Highfield from the Alliance for the Chesapeake Bay. This is the fourth installment of our uh, Force for the Bay uh, Woodland Workshop series that we've done this fall. Uh, it's comprised of both in-person and virtual um, sessions, and we've just had such a great time um, sharing all this information with you guys. Um, so tonight's presentation is obviously being recorded, and we will be able to send that link out to you guys in the next coming days. Um, and it is our hope to eventually get it up on our website for viewing later in case you want to come back and revisit any of this information. Um, so I'm going to hand over the ropes a little bit to Craig and we're going to get started. Excellent. Uh, thanks, Jackie. And thanks everyone for participating tonight. Uh, I'm just going to, okay, I guess you have to stop sharing. Okay. Okay, are we there now? Okay, I think I can share now. Okay. All right, you can see that? Yep, you're good to go. Okay, well, excellent. My name is Craig Highfield. I'm with the Alliance for the Chesapeake Bay. I'm the Forest Program Director. So I've uh, uh, just in case you haven't heard of the Alliance, um, really our mission really is to bring people together to do conservation. So we try to partner in everything that we're trying to do. We're based out of Annapolis, but we have offices in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, Washington, D.C., and Richmond, Virginia. So we do work throughout the, the Bay watershed. Um, we have four pillars of work uh, where we do everything. It's yeah, We have an agricultural focus forest focus, which is what I'm the director of, uh, green infrastructure and stewardship and engagement. Uh, but tonight we're going to talk about, we're going to get, you know, really into the forest and, and talk about a specific thing is uh, your woods and your wallet. So if you're here tonight, I'm assuming that you uh, have woodlands or interest in them, and we're going to kind of focus on the economics of it. So in our previous workshops, you know, we talked about woodland health with invasive plants, uh, we talked about forest ecology and some projects you could do on your property. Today, we're specifically going to talk about the economics of woodland ownership. Uh, and for this, I, I do want to thank our, our partners uh, in this program tonight. And of course, that's Harford Land Trust, uh, who are putting this on and hosting it. Uh, but also, this outreach effort has been a part of a grant that we got through Harford County and the Chesapeake Bay Trust. So I do want to thank them for help funding this. Uh, but let's first talk about Maryland's woodlands. So they are pretty remarkable. I mean, we, we, we'll, we'll talk, I mean, you're from Harford County and, and they're very unique in Harford County. But the woodlands in Harford County are going to be drastically different than what you find out in, say, Garrett or Allegheny County. And they're going to be drastically different than what you find down in Charles County or over on the Eastern Shore in Somerset. Um, you know, Maryland's a small state, but it, it you know, it's American in miniature, you might have heard. And our woodlands are, are that as well. So they're, they're so drastically different uh, depending where you are. And you can see even on this map, the different colors represent, represent different forest types. So a forest type is just an assemblage of, of different tree species. So, you know, you might see, you know, on the Eastern shore, a lot of loblolly pines. So you have a lot of pine mixtures where in Hartford County, you wouldn't find that. Um, and out in the, uh, Western Maryland, it, it'd be much different. And kind of the reason we're, we focus a lot in the Alliance about forests are, are, you know, forest is the natural landscape of the entire East. So before Europeans even settled here, you know, we had forests all over the East. It's what vegetation naturally climaxed 
uh, on uh, within the east, within our soils. We have the, the right soils, the right precipitation for there to be forests. Um, so when you know, the Europeans arrived, there's a whole lot of forests. And Native Americans were, were using a lot of that, but um, there's drastically different. So the, the Chesapeake Bay watershed, and this is our focus where a lot of our work is, was once 95% forested. Um, and so that landscape, that, that's a lot of forest. And if you think about the health of the bay, well, it was really impacted by the water that was coming through the forest. So, you know, the, the Chesapeake is very unique in that half of its water is fresh water that's coming off the land. So if you can imagine for thousands and thousands of years, the fresh water that was entering the Chesapeake came through a forest. It had to go through a forest. And so it was highly impacted, nice clean water that were, was, was coming through a forest and really impacted everything from blue crabs, underwater grasses, to the rockfish that came in and everything. So, um, but as you know, we started to settle uh, in the east, the amount of forest cover changed too. So you, you can't really farm in a forest like that. So we had to clear for, for how you know, we were living. So a lot of our forest was cleared and you can see the drastic amount of forest that was cleared uh, as we started to expand out. And this is in the Chesapeake Bay watershed. And then right at the turn of the century, you had a rebound of our forest cover. We, we actually have more forest now than we did you know, at the turn of the century into to 1900. And that's when people were leaving agricultural lands, uh, moving into the cities, we had the industrial revolution. So forest being that natural uh, vegetative community reemerged on, on the landscape. So chances are a lot of the forests that you might own were, you know, they're not that old. Uh, they're maybe, you know, 120, 80 to 120 years old if it's mature forest, because a lot of that was just grown when we left the land go, a forest reemerged. And so you, what you'll have on your property a lot of the times, unless you've had some forest management or a timber harvest is, you know, forests where all the trees are about similar age because they all grew back from an agricultural field. But you can see even on this chart, you know, by the time we hit the, the 1980s, we, we started to see, you know, a decline in our forest cover. Uh, and this just is, you know, Maryland's an urban state. So, you know, through development. So through a lot of development pressure, we were losing forests. And you can see even in Maryland, this is kind of old data. I was looking for a new chart. But, you know, even every year since, since the 70s, we've been losing forest in, in Maryland, forest cover. But we still have a lot. You know, 39% of Maryland uh, is forest cover. Uh, we have 2.46 million acres of forest, but you can see it, it's spread throughout the state. It, it's where, you know, most of it's where you expect it to be, you know, out in rural Western Maryland or, you know, lower Eastern shore, or Southern Maryland. Um, but, you know, we, we still have a lot of viable agriculture, but we still have forests. You know, we, we still have a forest products industry. You know, it's very important. But the unique thing about our forests, and this is true for the forests uh, in the east, is a majority of our forests, a vast majority of our forests are privately owned, you know, from people like you. So, you know, th that's much different than when you go in the west. And, you know, a majority of that forest you know, over 50% of it is publicly owned. So you have a lot of national forests and Bureau of Land Management. There, there's a lot of publicly owned forests out there, vast stretches of it. Here in the East, a majority of it is, is privately owned. In Maryland, it's about 72%. And so, it's, you know, something really unique over these years, though, about private land ownership is, well, you know, we're losing forests, but, you know, what's happening to a lot of our forests is, the ownership patterns are different. We're actually, the num the forest is going down, the, the acreage of that, but the number of forest landowners is actually going up. Uh, you can see a vast majority of forest landowners uh, actually own very small parcels. It's not a majority of the forest land, but it's a majority of the forest parcels. So, you know, if you think about it, land changes hands, you know, forests are divided up, maybe amongst family members, or, members or it's sold and parcelized and you get forest, more forest landowners of smaller acre size. And there's a reason, you know, I'm mentioning this. We'll, we'll, we'll get into that because it affects the economics of forest land ownership. And so what happens when our land is divided uh, into different parcels is called parcelization. So you might have it say, you know, a family owned 500 acres of, of land. Well, when it's divided, you know, amongst the children, that's called parcelization. It's divided ownership. 
And, and then, you know, within a forest, this happens as well. So you have large blocks of forest, and then you start to get different ownership patterns. And then what happens is, is called fragmentation. So as one landowner changes the, the land use of that forest, maybe clears it out for, you know, sells it off to development or so, you have what is called fragmentation. And that's conversion of forest to non-forest use. And this affects the economics of forest ownership as well. And we're going to get all into that um, today. And so, you know, the, the negative effects of fragmentation, you know, is one thing. If you can imagine this picture at one time, it would be one solid forest. You know, and this happens to be a little bit of development, but you have a lot of agricultural lands as well, is, you know, when you start to divide or fragment the forest, uh, one thing you have isolated habitat. So, you know, it, it reduces the gene pool of a lot of the wildlife, especially the smaller wildlife that, that need, that don't move between these patches. Um, you increase edge, and I think this is the big one. So an edge is just kind of the edge of the forest, if you think the outside edge. And so this just makes our forests more vulnerable to invasive plants. Uh, invasive plants you'll tend, and I you probably have them on your property, um, you know, they, they tend to prefer the edge of a forest where there's light and where they can outcompete things. So that definitely impacts uh, the economics of forests when you have to deal with them to, to improve forest health. Um, increasing number of forest owners just means that there's a lot more ownership out there and, you know, resources for land care and stewardship you know, has to be divided. And there's really not enough technical service out there or technical service providers to reach everyone. And, and I guess the main thing when you think about economics of that is, you know, owning smaller land, you, you just, there's a decrease in opportunity of what you can do with your land, how you manage your property. Um, and so those are just kind of the effects. Uh, and, and so if you're a, a landowner, you know, you have other things that are affecting the health of your forest and, and what your goals would be. You know, things like invasive plants, you know, on those edge effects. You have there on the, the, the top left, Japanese barberry, which is one that's spreading rapidly, I, I've noticed. Uh, but it's a shrub, so invasive plants can come in shrubs. And, you know, they're affecting that new forest growing up under there or what natively or native plants could be there. So they're occupying that space. Um, you have Tree of Heaven or Atlantis, which is the tree on the right, which, you know, is a very aggressive tree growing from roots, putting up new trees from its roots. Um, and so they can spread out. And, you know, there's very little value to Atlantis, you know, both from wildlife perspective, but also, you know, as far as, as lumber or timber. Um, you know, you could have herbaceous grasses like Microstesium, which is in the bottom left. And you can see there, if you look into that forest, well, you know, you have your, your, your trees in the canopy, but there's really nothing underneath except that microstesium. It's preventing, it's affecting forest health because it's preventing a new forest from emerging or even that understory. And then you have things like vines, like this kudzu. Uh, this is actually over in Kent County, but under that kudzu is, is a barn. Uh, it was an abandoned barn, but there's nothing left because the kudzu took it over. So those are definitely challenges to, to forest land ownership. We'll kind of get into how to deal with uh, some of the challenges as well. Um, but you also have things like this affecting the economics of our forest or invasive insects. Uh, there has, you know, there hasn't been one so damaging, I, I think, uh, is the top left or the, uh, the, the ash borer. So emerald ash borer uh, came in and, and in the 2000s, early 2000s uh, into Maryland, and it's just devastated our ash trees. Um, you know, if you're lucky to have ash still growing on your tree, I mean, count yourself lucky. It, it has wiped out a lot of our ash trees. And I know in, in, in Hartford, uh, you now have the spotted lantern fly. I've, I've been up there and seen it, but it's, no, it's, it's nowhere near as destructive as, as some of these here, like the gypsy moth or um, the one on the left is, it's also, I don't know if it's made to Harford yet. It's in Cecil. It's a walnut twig beetle there on the uh, bottom left. Uh, that affects our, our walnut trees. It delivers a fungus to the walnut trees that, that causes a disease called thousand cankers disease. Um, and then on the right uh, bottom is the hemlock woolly adelgid, which is wiping out a lot of our hemlock trees. So it definitely is a challenge to owning uh, woodlands and, and keeping them healthy uh, and for your own enjoyment. Uh, deer is another big one. Um, it's just an un, 
uh, it's unsustainable uh, deer population. So our, our deer population has increased and has been increasing for a while. Uh, and you can see on these pictures where you may not notice it, you know, at first in your forest, but, you know, deer, they eat everything that they can reach, any kind of vegetation. So you can see how this land has really been cleared um, by an overabundance deer population. Um, you can see on the, the bottom left-hand corner on that picture, that was a, a harvest that had gone through in that forest and the deer fence was put up. Everything on the left, the deer were fenced out. And you can see the, the, the vegetation, all the trees regrowing back. And on the right, it just hasn't responded that way because the deer have devastated things. And then the last thing is, and we're gonna kind of get into this with the economics, is this still happens and it's affecting forest health uh, and, and also the economics of your forest, you know, how valuable your forest is, and it's called high grade harvesting. So we do promote, you know, landowners to, to harvest their forest. Absolutely. We, we think it's, it's good for Maryland, it's good for the landowner, and it could be, it's good for your forest too, when done correctly. Uh, but there is a, 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 a type of harvesting, it's called high grading. And that's, you know, cut the best, leave the rest is, is how it's termed. But and that's if, you know, uh, forest products industry, a logger would come in and just want to harvest your property, but leave trees there. And if you let them just do it like that without having someone on your side to, to pick which trees get cut, they'll end up taking all the valuable trees out of your property. So the biggest and the most valuable, like the most valuable oaks and the biggest oaks. So they'll cut those out and they'll leave the rest, which tend to be a loader, lower grade tree, lower value tree both uh, for, for timber, but also for wildlife as well, because oaks are very, very valuable. So uh, high grading, high grade harvesting is also a, a tough thing that still does happen. But you know, enough with the negative. Landowners are part of the solution to all this because we all get benefits from a forest. I don't own a forest, but I'm reaping the benefits of a forest. All Marylanders do. And so most of our forests are privately owned. So you might have your reason why you own your forest land and what you like about it. You know, think about it. You know, is it recreation? Try to, try to, I mean, you probably have all your reasons, but, you know, recreation is a big one. A lot of people own their land for, you know, just seeing the trees, seeing the wildlife, hunting per, uh, potentially, or just walking through their woods, uh, just having a peace quiet. You know, just getting out of the city, being able to live in the country a little bit. You know, you might have your property be just for that, just a place to relax. Um, you know, there's others who might have interest in wood products or non-timber forest products or, or easements or hunting leases. Um, there's higher property values to actually owning woodlands on your property. And that's been shown, uh, national studies from uh, realtor agencies that, you know, properties with trees and forests sell for higher value than, than properties without. You know, they provide clean air and water uh, and they clean our even drinking water and, and they kind of protect the Chesapeake uh, with the water that's coming down uh, from your streams and rivers. Uh, so that's, you know, we always like to say, you know, these private woodlands are doing the public good. And, and it's kind of been our mantra in, in why we're doing all this work of reaching out to private woodland owners, because, you know, your woods are providing benefits to all Marylanders. You know, and there's things that'll help you take care of it. So there's economic incentives because of that public good your, your forests are doing that encourage you to keep your woods and keep them healthy. And one of those things that we'll talk about are a couple uh, tax incentive programs within Maryland that you could take advantage of if you haven't done so already. That, you know, lowers the, the, the property tax on your forest land because of the value it's providing to all of Maryland. And feel free to stop me at any point if, if, if there are questions on there. I think you can put them in the chat. Um, so step one with, with forest ownership or, you know, even thinking about it is get out and enjoy your land. You know, if you haven't done so, I'm sure you already do. But, you know, if you have woodlands, get out and learn about them. Just get out and walk and kind of know your land. Uh, I, I advocate that a lot to landowners. So you kind of figure out what your property is, what your trees are like. Um, where the value in is that? Because <laughs> this was a quote from one of my colleagues in Baltimore County. He talked about that when dealing with landowners is, you know, talking to one landowner 
And he was asking her about her forest and what she liked from it, what she wanted from it. And, you know, her response was, I, I didn't want all this land. It just came with the house. Um, and, you know, if that's the case, I mean, how, how much value do you think someone puts into their, to their land, to their resource, if, you know, they haven't been out into it, that they don't know anything about it? You know, this, there, I, there I am. This is another, I don't mean to pick on Baltimore County, but this was a project we were doing in Baltimore County and we came across this giant, giant white oak tree. Uh, it, it was five feet in diameter. It was large. Um, so we're on private land. We showed this picture actually to the landowner and it was probably two, about 100, 150 yards from their house. They had no idea this was even on their property. This is just this massive, massive old historic tree. And it probably marked the corner of an ag field. If you could see how small those trees are around it, uh, it, it was the corner of a property probably. Uh, but this is just just a massive, very unique, very old white oak tree, the uh, state tree of Maryland. So, you know, just kind of knowing what's on your property, what special resources do you have out there? And the next thing I, I would say, you know, with, with having, you know, woodlands and, and thinking about the economics and, and how it's going to affect your wallet is, you know, have a plan for your for your woods. You know, think about what it is you like about your woods. If it's something that you want to increase wildlife, you like seeing wildlife, um, you know, think about what you want this property look looking like years from now. And there's ways to get there. So have a plan uh, for your property. And planning begins with an end in mind. So you're thinking years ahead about your property because because forests they change very slowly and they grow very slowly compared to other things that are out there. So. Um, the next thing I would encourage you, especially if you have larger acreages and you haven't done this, is work with a forester. Uh, if you have things that you want to do on your property, um, we're very, very fortunate in Maryland that anybody who claims to, uh, or anyone who is actually going to call themselves a forester has to be licensed by the state. Okay, just someone can't come up and say, I'm a forester, I'm going to do this if they haven't gone to forestry school. And that's four year university education. Uh, and you have to have a license with continuing education credits to maintain your license. So, you know, you have to be a professional. I mean, I can't call myself a lawyer uh, or a doctor uh, if I'm not one of those, if I haven't had the training for that. So foresters are like that. In Pennsylvania, anybody can call themselves a forester. In Virginia, anybody can call themselves a forester and provide services. Uh, but in Maryland, you have to be a licensed forester. And there's several types that we have out there. So one, uh, and like most states, uh, we have service foresters. So uh, foresters that work for Maryland Department of Natural Resources. So Maryland Forest Service is an agency within DNR, uh, and they have foresters spread throughout Maryland. Uh, used to be in, in every county would have a forester. Some count, some there's uh, one forester for two counties. Um, but in Harford County, you have a forester who works for Maryland Forest Service. Dan Lewis is his name. Uh, he just moved up from the Montgomery and uh, Howard County. He was the based out of there, but I think he's local to, to Cecil County. Uh, he's a great forester. He's employed by the state. So he can give you advice on stewardship opportunities and programs. He could come out to your land. He's a public forester. He, he works for you essentially. Um, he can write and help implement forest stewardship plans. So we're gonna talk about a forest stewardship plan or having that planned in mind. He can write one for you. There is a nominal fee now from the state. They used to do these for free, but now there's a, a nominal fee for a stewardship plan. But these plans are very important, but he can write that plan for you. Um, the only thing he can't really do is be involved in a timber harvest because that's that's a private transaction between, you know, a landowner and the forest products industry. So he can't be involved in negotiating price like that because he does work for the public. He, he's a public forester. Or yeah, Dan's a public forester. Uh, you can also, there's consulting foresters. And these are just simply private contractors. You know, like you would hire a lawyer, um, you know, it's a, kind of the same thing. There, there's foresters out there who've been trained that are hired by landowners as kind of their agent. Um, he, they can develop forest management plans for you or forest stewardship plans. They can help you implement the management recommendations. So let's say you get a plan from Dan, it says, 
you know, to improve forest health, do this, that, and, and the other. You know, they can help you implement those things. Um, if you're interested in a timber harvest, they're your agent. So they can appraise your timber by, you know, telling you how much they, you know, it would be worth. Um, they put it out to bid to, you know, the forest products companies uh, and try to get the best money for your timber. Um, but they work for you. So, you know, it, it's great to have a plan. And if you're going to do a timber harvest, have your own consulting forester. And there's a list out there. Uh, Maryland Forest Service has that you can get from them. Uh, our website, uh, Forest for the Bay, also has a list of all the consulting foresters uh, in Maryland, registered in Maryland. There's also industrial foresters, and they work for the forest products industry. So they'll work for, you know, Edrich Lumber, or they'll work for, you know, Gladfelder Paper, which I can't remember what their new name is. It's no longer Gladfelder. But so they work for the forest products industry. So, you know, you can work directly with them, but keep in mind, you know, they want, it, they want your timber, which is, is fine. They can conduct a harvest, but they're going to want to pay the lowest price they can. You know, they'll negotiate with you on that. So they're not they're not bad. They just want the best price for their industry. Um, so if you're not comfortable with that, it's always best to work with your own forester. Um, uh, the next ones, and the last ones are extension foresters. And unfortunately, there's only two in the state of Maryland. One that covers kind of the western shore and one that covers the eastern shore. Um, but extension foresters work for the University of Maryland. And, and what they do is purely provide natural resources education. So they take research and they, they explain it well. They're, they're great teachers of how to take care of your, your property. They have a great website and they offer all kinds of programs um, throughout Maryland. Um, a lot of classes, they, uh, they do classes for landowners that are you know, three days long, uh, woodland stewardship classes. Uh, they're really great. So they help conduct research and they just put out new information about, uh, uh, well, fact sheets about new studies that are coming in with your forests. So they're great. Uh, so the, the next thing, because I just wanted to hit this, I'll explain what they are, but I kind of wanted to hit this because I refer to them a lot uh, in this next section. But because your woodlands are providing kind of that public service, there's public money available to help you take care of your property. Um, you know, let's say, you know, invasive plants have taken over large portions of your property. Well, there's money out there from the state and the federal government that will help you try to control those plants to bring your forest health back. Uh, and they're called cost share programs. You know, they're sharing the cost of stewardship. Uh, Maryland Forest Service has one, which is very unique because very few states have a, a, a uh, cost share program for woodland owners. It's usually the federal government does. And it's called the Woodland Incentives Program or WIP. And it'll cover 65% of uh, any of the practice that you do. So invasive plant removal, it'll cover 65% of any of the costs that you incur for that. Uh, the other one's the Environmental Quality Incentives Program. And that's a federal program through the Natural Resources Conservation Service, which is located, they have office in every uh, county uh, in Maryland. So it's something that's typically available for farmers, but woodland owners, I mean, you're growing a crop, it, it's trees. So uh, there are programs that will help pay the, some of the costs to take care of your forests. Uh, and the last one is, is through another federal agency that has offices in every county. It's called the Farm Services Agency. Uh, and they have a program to help you put trees along streams. Uh, and this is a great one because the benefits are great. You can get up to 100% cost share on this. It's actually increased. Um, and then they'll give you annual rental payments for that land that's now in trees. And this has to be along a, a waterway. So there, there's some great programs. I'm just gonna refer to those in, in this next section. So I wanted to make sure you were aware of that. So th th this is the key, if you do not have one and you have, you know, at least I'd say 10 acres of, of woods, I'd suggest you, you get one for your property. This is really the key to any kind of conservation. Um, to, to all those cost share programs, you need to have a stewardship plan. Um, you know, you recommend, I, we recommend one. 
uh, to do a timber harvest, to get any of these conservation programs, like even easement programs, you have to have a stewardship plan if you have you know, large enough forests. But I think they're great. They're, they're a guide to, to let you know what you have on your property, what type of forest you have, what are the special parts of your forest. So these have to be written by a professional forester. I'm going to take you through this one. I've, I've taken the name out, but um, this was written by Maryland Forest Service, but I'll take you through what this is, what it includes. So first of all, to have one written, you have to have at least five acres. Maryland Forest Service can write one for you, but they require 10 acres or more of forest. Um, and you can see they'll charge anywhere between 200 and $275 for the plan. The plan is good for 15 years. So that, you know, forests grow slow. They give you recommendations to implement over 15 years. Um, you can also get a consultant or a for you know a consultant forester to write uh, write it. They can use that WIP program and bring down the cost to around two hundred to two hundred seventy five dollars. Um, and then you can also get a consultant to write it through EQIP. So they you can get cost share to get it written through EQIP, and that's a practice payment. So depending on the size of your property, it can reduce the cost. It, it's you know, it's a little more burdensome to go through Equip to do it. Um, it's easier through WIP, but the you know you could end up paying zero dollars if you do it through Equip. It's a little bit harder. You have to wait a longer periods of time, but it can be better if you're if you're willing to wait for it. Great thing I love about these plans and why they're so important is if you kind of look at the bottom there, the last sentence. It says the. Forest Stewardship Plan will recommend practices that will be a balance of the needs of the landowner and of the forest. So what they're looking at when a forester actually will write the plan is they'll want to know what your goals are. What are your stewardship goals for your property right from the beginning? And then what they do is they take data on your forest, what kind of trees, how big they are, your soils, and they'll give you recommendations on how to achieve those goals. Okay, they'll let you know they want to balance. So you keep your forest healthy, but you can reach what your goals are. And so normally they'll, they'll give you, you know, stewardship things to choose from. So goals to choose from, you know, fish and everything from fish and wildlife, natural heritage and recreation, soil and water or forest products. You kind of pick what your top goals are. And what they do is write recommendations based on your goals. So you can see if you look up, this landowner was really interested in harvesting some timber but he wanted a future timber crop. So he, he didn't want to harvest it all now because later, say 10 years, he wanted to be able to do another harvest. But he was really uh, concerned about soil, keeping the soil healthy and protecting water quality. So based on that, we'll kind of go through this plan. We'll see how it was written to help the landowner. They're not going to tell you what to do. They're going to give you those recommendations based on your goals. So the first thing they're going to do is, is kind of come in with a map of your property. So this is a you know this is a typical agricultural woodlands. You know it's the woods are where you you don't farm anymore. So it's usually steeper hills, just areas that's tough to farm. Um, so if you look at this piece of forest, that's probably about twenty acres uh, total there. But if you look at it, there's numbers on there. So those are called forest stands. And so you see one, two, three, and there's six. You can imagine there's a four and five in there too. Uh, what that is, is they're coming on your property and they're going to take data. They're going to look at your trees. They're going to identify all the species, what species you have, the size of those trees, the types of soil they're growing on, the height of the tree. Um, they're going to look at all those things. And then they're going to put them together to see what the commonality of those trees are. So you can look at stand one, even though they're in different areas, all those trees are very similar size, age, um, you know, width. So they're pretty similar. So you would treat that kind of as that management unit. So the ones is gonna be stand number one. If you go to two, it's gonna be maybe totally different trees. You know, might, that's the upland. You can see one that's around a water area. So it's low lying. Uh, you'll have like your tulip poplars in there and, uh, you would have ash if you if you had ash, um, river birch, things like that. But when you get into the upper areas, like twos and threes, it's a little bit higher. So you'll start to see oaks in there uh, as well. So they kind of classify it by what's there. You kind of treat those areas differently. So let's take a look real quick. So if you looked at that stand number one, that was number one there. 
So what they've identified are the, the dominant species of tree that are in stand number one. So dominant would be tulip poplar, sweet gum, and sycamore. There's a, all kind of those, those wetland, not wetland trees, but you know, riparian trees. So you'll find those in kind of the more moist soils, but those are the trees you'll find that those are the dominant ones in there. They'll give you understory species as well. Uh, pawpaw, which, you know, if, if you want to collect fruit, I mean, that's good to know that that's on your property, you know, uh, spice bush as well, or beech coming up through, it'll tell you the size of those trees. So unfortunately, a lot of this is in forester term. Uh, saw timber just means a big tree, mature, um, that you could harvest for timber if you wanted to. It just means that it's, it's a big tree. Pole timber, it's, it's a skinnier tree, you know, it's like 10 inches in diameter and smaller. And then they make it simple. Anything there is small tree. So if it's not within that period, if it's not pole timber, it's just a small tree. It tells you the ages of those trees. So they'll take core samples of a few of the trees in there to see what the ages are in there. So on this one, it's an uneven stand, meaning that that property had a timber harvest at one time. And so there's different ages of trees, where on sun properties, all the trees are the same age because it's never been harvested. It's just have grown back from a farm field. Uh, stocking is really, they give an evaluation of, you know, it's kind of like a garden when you have maybe, you know, if you're planting carrots and you have too many carrots growing together and they're competing really well and they could be stunted. So an overstock, you know, this tree maybe has too many trees growing. That means trees aren't putting on any more growth. They slow down considerably. And then growth potential, they're really looking at soils on that. How well is those soils to grow trees? And it's an excellent on there. But since that landowner said they wanted to protect soil and water quality, you know, they're going to look at this and say, well, if that's what your goal is, so on this, their recommendation is just maintain it as a buffer, a riparian buffer. You have trees along that stream, it's protecting the soil, it's protecting the water. Uh, but if there's invasive plants, that's going to affect the health of that forest. So their recommendation for stand one was just maintain it and, you know, try to control the invasive plants that are there. Um, they said if you wanted to increase the buffer size on some of those areas, you could do that through crep, whip, or equip. So it, it's giving you recommendations based on that. So it's a quick look at stand number two, and this will be the, <laughs> the last stand we look at. But stand number two, Again, look at the dominant overstory species, tulip poplar, red oak, white oak. Okay, those are all, you know, timber-wise high value trees. Um, you can see the understory, slightly different. The beach is still there. Um, but you can tell this is an upland site. So it's not riparian based by what trees are there, or what trees are there with the oaks and that muscle wood. Um, and then timber size, again, you have a lot of bigger trees. And so looking at this, Part of that landowner's goal was to harvest trees, to have a, a timber harvest somewhere. So we'll look at stand two and say, hey, well, maybe that's the place. If you're going to do a harvest, you do it only in stand number two, um, because that's the one where it has larger trees. It was overstocked, meaning there's a lot of trees there uh, right now that you can lose some and other trees will grow better. So they'll, they'll say you can have a commercial timber harvest. This is where they'd recommend it rather than stand one. Um, it's the best opportunity you have to make money, some income. Uh, they recommended a, a harvest type. So there's many harvest types that you can have everywhere from a clear cut, which is cutting all the trees, to a selective cut, which is only cutting some of the trees. Now, this is the real important part because when I talked about high grading, a high grade is a selective cut, but a, all selective cuts are not a high grading. So a selective cut this guy's recommending is a mixture of high and low quality trees. So you're going to have some maybe some bigger oaks, but you might be taking out some of the smaller oaks as well that might be malformed. The idea is you're going to harvest with the idea that you want the remaining trees to have enough room to grow bigger. But those trees have to be, you want to leave some of your high quality trees still in the forest because they're producing quality seed and, and they're valuable. They can get bigger. So the idea on this one is making sure that you're taking both high and low quality trees in that selective harvest, and you're leaving really good trees in there as well. That just increases the value of your property. If you were to go in there and take all those high value trees out of there, 
you've just taken the value out of your forest, at least from timber uh, perspective, but a lot of times in wildlife as well. Um, they recommend, since they can't be involved in harvest, that you work with your own consultant, that you hire a consultant to work with the forest products industry to do that. Um, but they, they're not gonna tell you to do a harvest, though they might recommend it if that's what your goal is. If it's not your goal, they may not say it, but they do recommend then, if you're not gonna harvest, that you do a timber stand improvement. And that just means like thinning a garden. Because it's so overstocked, you might want to have a few trees just cut down. They could be removed or just lay on the forest floor after they're cut. What that does, it just gives more space for the remaining trees to expand. Um, they can, DNR can, the Maryland Forest Service can mark those trees uh, that should be taken out. And what they're looking for are those malformed trees, you know, the trees that are starting to get overtopped anyways, that aren't gonna grow much to clear the room and, or to clear the forest. Uh, and this is, there's cost share to help you do that kind of stuff because it's not a commercial thinning. Uh, you know, loggers are not coming in to make money on it. They're just cutting trees to lay them down to create more space for your remaining forest to get bigger. And like I said, this is, these plans are good for 15 years. So you write them once in 15 years, they're, they're good. And they're gonna give you those recommendations. And it's not like you have to tackle everything on that right at first. It gives you those 15 years to, to kind of look at it and see what you want to do on it. Uh, there's, here are the practices when we talked about those, you know, you have a stewardship plan. So some of the, those things in there, some of those practices, there's cost share for. So things like, you know, invasive plants, um, putting in a riparian forest buffer, planting more trees, habitat management. So if you have a certain species you want to, to uh, you know, do management for, you know, it could be something like quail, which requires you to do a bigger harvest on it. Or, you know, if it's, uh, you know, say an oven bird, if you're really into some sort of those FIDS type birds, uh, there's habitat management stuff you can do to, you know, make sure there's an understory growing in there. So uh, harvest preparation, and then that tree thinning. So that's cost share on that. So I will go over the forest products market just so you do kind of understand that. I'm not telling you to harvest. I'm not telling you not to harvest. Um, the forest products market, but remarkably, most people, when they, they think of, of Maryland, they don't think of the forest products industry. Uh, but it is strong. For a tiny state like us, we do grow a lot of great trees. Uh, there are harvests out there. Our, actually, our, our forest products industry actually is bigger than our seafood industry. And most people, when they think of Maryland, they think Chesapeake and crab cakes and seafood, but uh, it generates more uh, in Maryland uh, than our seafood industry. So say forest products from Hartford County, where do, what happens to the lumber that's coming out? So you'll see those, those logging trucks come out. So our hardwood, which will be the broadleaf trees, like your oaks and maples and cherries and stuff, uh, they're harvested for lumber, uh, construction mats, uh, which is, you know, you put them down for equipment to move over, flooring, molding, furniture, pallets, pulpwood, uh, and there's very, 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 very minor pine uh, that comes out of Hartford County. It, it's minimal, uh, and it goes to things, pallets, wood shavings, and pulp. Those are the big three. So those are the big valuable ones right now, and the forest market changes all the time, but Maryland's really good at growing these three. Uh, and so Hartford County, kind of central Maryland, the big three really are a tulip poplar, um, white oak, and red oak. In, in white oak, you know, the, there's several within there, like a chestnut oak is a white oak. Um, you know, in red oak, you have northern, southern red oak, northern red oak, scarlet oak, black oak. They're all considered the red oaks as well. So those are really the, the big three um, uh, in Hartford County, kind of in the central central uh, Maryland region that's being harvested. Who can buy your trees? So if you were going to harvest, well, sawmills or pulp mills. So things like Edrich Lumber, you know, they're, they're in business because they, they need trees from private land because most of our uh, land is, is privately owned um, to make, you know, lumber or steaks, you know, or the variety of things that they make. So they have a sawmill, they're buying from private landowners to run their sawmills. Pulp mills as well. Uh, the thing with pulp, you know, a lot of times they're taking low grade trees uh, for pulp. 
um, on the eastern shore of the plantations, you know, they, they take kind of the smaller ones when they're thinning, but, you know, pulp can be really made from any type of tree. So a lot of times they're not buying your, your, your nice trees. It, it's the smaller trees, um, you know, it's a variety of species to get the pulp. And that would be like uh, in Gladfeld or right over the, the line in Pennsylvania. Uh, independent logger could do, could buy your trees. So they would, you know, be a logging operation that would come to your property. Uh, give you money and then they would log it themselves and they would sell it in, either to a mill or, or a, a pulp mill or a sawmill. And then there are dealers or kind of the middleman. They, they don't really exist that much in, in Maryland. I get this question all the time though. You know, when we do a lot of woodland tours is really, you know, how much is my tree worth? Uh, and, you know, that's tough to say. I can, you know, you can tell you exactly what that tree might be worth if they look at a tree. And so there are timber market reports that'll tell you you know, Northern Red Oak, you know, 320 uh, board, thousand board feet. So we'll, we'll kind of go over this. So you can actually measure a tree and figure out what it would go for in the market. Um, you know, for instance, you know, just using this Biltmore stick here and measuring it and seeing how many board feet are in there. So red maple in the market report there, it was $380 for a thousand board feet. And a board foot is just, you know, if you can imagine a board that's one inch thick, uh, one foot wide, one foot in length. That's a board foot. So they measure stuff in that like, like it's timber. So if you took, you could just do the calculation, just using math right here uh, in this Biltmore stick. You know, so a tree that's 22 inches in diameter um, would produce and has a log length. That just means it's 22 feet long, 22 inches in diameter produces about 860 board feet. And so you divide that by the, the, the thousand board feet, $327 for that maple tree is what it would be worth in timber. Uh, but, you know, it's not that easy. You know, I wish it was that easy because there's so many other things uh, to consider on your property uh, for a timber harvest. One is acreage, and that's the big one. You can have really great trees, but if you only have six acres, it's really gonna to be tough to find somebody that would come onto your property to do a harvest. It's just too small. There's just not enough trees there. Uh, topography is a, is a big issue as well. You know, can you get the trees? It, it, you know, they have to cut them and get them out. Uh, that's, you know, could be too difficult if it's really steep hills. And that's something you may not wanna take the trees off, you know, steep hills. I wouldn't recommend that. It would, you know, be a lot of, uh, erosion and things. Uh, species mix or what type of trees you have. You know, we're talking about those big three or the big hardwoods. Uh, quality of trees, you want to make sure they have nice long stems. You know, you can have a lot of trees that are high quality, but if they have, you know, a lot of stems down low, they're not going to be worth as much. Uh, the time of year, you know, age, time of year changes as well. So in the spring, it's tough to do a harvest because it's so wet in there and you probably wouldn't do that. Uh, current mar markets, they're always kind of going up and down. You know, at one time, white oak was the, by far the king. And now, now red oak kind of surpassed that. And they're always changing. So the markets do change. And you can remember a couple months ago when uh, uh, lumber was so hard to get. It was so expensive. It, it was like gold. But see, the, the market changed so drastically after that. Uh, access to timber is just, you know, where on the property it is, and then any other restrictions. So every county is going to have some type of restriction on a timber harvest or some rules to follow on there. Some counties, it's harder to harvest timber uh, than others. So kind of knowing what those restrictions are. So I would say if you're even considering doing a timber harvest or exploring that, I'd say, and you haven't done so, is get to know Maryland Forest Service. You know, they're, they're your foresters, they work for you, they're the public foresters, and they can just give you some information. Um, get a referral if you're, if you're gonna work with a forester. Um, ask fellow landowners, you know, who, who, who is a forester that, that worked really well with you? Um, check with their previous clients. If you get a recommendation, you know, ask that forester for previous clients and talk to them. And this is, you know, if you're gonna do a forest harvest, that's a, you know, it's a big thing. It could be a wonderful thing on your property, but it could also be a disaster. Discuss your goals with a forester. If a forester is trying to tell you what your goals are, that's not a forester for you. It's your property. It's your woods. You know, they should be following what your goals are. And then always kind of use a plan. I'd recommend you get a plan and use it. To find out where the best place that you're going to harvest. Um, and it's from your plan. You're an informed citizen if you have an informed woodland owner. 
But there's also things you can do on your property that doesn't require cutting trees down. You know, sometimes cutting trees can actually be a great thing for the forest health and wildlife, but you know, a lot of times it's not necessary if that's not your thing or if you have woodlands that are too small, but there's other ways to generate income uh, within your forest, it, you know, just using your imagination. You know, I know a farmer in Prince George's County who's growing ginseng. You know, it can grow anywhere in Maryland. It, it's very site specific, but there's probably places in your property that it would grow. And, you know, once you get ginseng going, um, growing within your forest, because that's where ginseng naturally grows, it kind of protects the wild ginseng, you know, out in Western Maryland. But, you know, there's high values. There's a market for it right now. So hundreds of dollars per, per pound that people are getting. And people are doing it in Maryland. Um, you know, shiitake mushrooms from some logs that you might be thinning out. You can grow that right in a forest. Hunting leases are, are another big one. A, a, a tough thing is, you know, for hunting, and, and I'm a hunter, is finding access to land to be able to hunt. So, you know, and if you have access, you almost want to have rights on it, like, you know, exclusive rights. So hunting leases are a valuable way to take care of deer issues, but also, you know, make a little income as well, uh, if that's what you like. And then, you know, whatever your imagination is. So this was all in one farm that uh, in Prince George's County where they do it. And they do, you know, Christmas greenery out of their forest as well. So they have white pine, they actually have lava lolly pine, uh, boxwood on their, uh, actually near one of the houses there. And they do Christmas greenery from that. And, and they, they do make some good money around Christmas time just by harvesting some of the stuff from the woods. And there's other programs out there. This one actually just entered Maryland. So Nature Conservancy and American Forest Foundation are doing a car, family forest carbon program. And that's essentially, they're, they're helping landowners access, you know, carbon markets. So forests, you know, retain, they sequester a lot of carbon. They're, they're essentially just carbon, what a tree is, or carbon and water mainly. And so they are sequestering a lot of carbon. A lot of corporations are looking for ways to reduce their carbon footprint. And so they're working with the Nature Conservancy to try to fund projects that reduce it. So they're paying landowners to do certain practices for their forest to sequester carbon. Uh, one of them actually is, re, uh, is longer rotation of, of a timber harvest. So if you're planning a timber harvest, if you hold off for a few years and allow the trees to get more carbon, there's a payment involved in that. So I don't want to get too much into their program, but they are actually, I think it's from Carroll County West is where they're offering the program right now. So there's certain practices like invasive plant management could be eligible for a carbon uh, payment because it's allowing the forest to grow back by controlling invasives. Um, but it is kind of unique. They, they've done this in Pennsylvania. Uh, now they're trying it out in Maryland and West Virginia. So it's another option for landowners that hopefully into the future uh, we'll see available for all Marylanders. Uh, so now there's woodland tax incentives. These are ones I wanna get into uh, a little bit. Maryland's lucky they have two property tax abatement programs. One is called the Forest Conservation and Management Agreement. Um, and so this is very, there's good information we could provide to you on this, but this is, uh, kind of like a, a term easement program. So it's a 15 year program, but what it does is, you know, it's based on your acreage, but it freezes your tax rate, uh, your property tax rate on your land at $125 per acre. It doesn't matter where it is. It's going to, if you're in this program, it's going to be 120, it's going to be assessed at $125 an acre. So let's say these two land scenarios here where, you know, property on the left, 25 acres, let's say the assessed value of that's $5,000. And I don't know what it would be, but let's say it's a fast growing, very expensive county. You know, a property tax on that 25 acres could be $1,250 per year. By enrolling in this program, you're freezing it at $125. So that annual property tax on that woodland part is only $31. So you can see how drastically it drops that just by entering that program. Now, this is an easement program for 15 years. Meaning, if you decide to develop that forest, you would have to pay back the back taxes on that um, just for this program. And it's just in that portion that was redeveloped. So um, that kind of holds you into the program. There's another one called Woodland Assessment Program. And this is the second one. This is the easy one. It's easy one to get into. 
It only has five contiguous acres. You can enroll in it. Uh, you need a forest stewardship plan, just like the other one. You need a plan. And this essentially is kind of similar, but it has a tax rate of 187 instead of 125 per acre. And this is variable, meaning it can change. It hasn't changed in the 15 years I've been doing this job. It's at 187, but it can change. The other one cannot change. It's 125. Legislature would have to change the law. This one can change and it hasn't. And this is just taking it uh, to your tax assessment office and say, I have a forest stewardship plan and you're in. Um, there are inspections on both every three years on this one, just making sure you haven't developed into that forest. But it's the same scenario, $12.50 or $48, you know, for that forest, the assessment on that. So that, that's quite a bit of savings, I think, annually, just by keeping your forest there and having a stewardship plan on it. And a lot of people do have stewardship plans just because of that. Uh, there is the state, state income tax modification program, which, you know, Anything that you're doing in your forest, let's say you're in controlling invasives, you're planting trees on, you know, next to your forest, you can deduct twice the cost of that on your state taxes. So it's kind of an incentive for landowners to, to manage their properties, to do things in their forest to improve forest health. And you can deduct that twice, you know, twice the cost of it on your state taxes. Uh, so in the last thing, you know, well, you know, we, a four stewardship plan, they're great. Sometimes they are difficult to understand when you start to read them. We do offer a free service um, that will help you interpret your four stewardship plan. If you have one or if you get one, you don't quite understand it. We'll work with you and kind of spell it all out uh, and tell you what your options are based on what they're saying in that property. We'll kind of give you some, some uh, uh, cliff notes on, on that stewardship plan because sometimes they can be written in forestry terms, but we can help you access different things. And that's the free thing that we do. Um, this is one we did for in Carroll County, but we'll break it down into a nice report. Uh, and the last thing I do before we're going to conservation easements is I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention, we do have a program called Healthy Forest, Healthy Waters. Uh, and this is a, a reforestation program. So if you have anywhere on your property that you're looking to reforest or convert into woodlands, we have a program that's free to any landowner. So essentially it's a turnkey project. If you're interested, we hire contractors to come in, plant whatever portion of the land that you want into a forest. And then those same contractors come back for three years uh, and they take care of it. So they'll mow it, uh, they can spot spray herbicide to help those trees grow. Uh, you know, into a forest. So they take care of them in those first few crucial years and it doesn't cost the landowner anything. So we've actually had a lot of landowners from Hartford County participate in this, but uh, if you are interested, you know, let me know, we can talk. Uh, Jackie can send out my information for sure. All right, on that, I'm gonna actually uh, throw it over to Jackie unless there's some questions. All right. Let me share my screen. All right, can everybody everybody see that? Yes. Okay, thank you. <laughs> All right, um, great. So I'm gonna take a few minutes here to talk about conservation easements. Um, it's another great tool in your toolbox uh, as a way to preserve lands, especially if you have um, forested lands on your property, but really it can go for any, any land type, forested, open space, agricultural. Um, so again, as Craig said, if at any point in time during this you have any questions, uh, uh, please feel free to just um, unmute yourself and then ask it. Um, so uh, basics, conservation easements 101, they are recorded legal agreements um, that go with the land uh, rather than the person. So this is a perpetual easement. It is with it is tied to the land forever, uh, meaning that if you put an easement on your property and then either through estate planning or um, your resale, it goes with the property. So the next person who inherits the property or purchases the property will have to abide by this easement as well. Uh, it is always voluntary, uh, but it is permanent, as I said. Generally, there are two types of donated um, there are two types of easements, donated or purchased. Donated means that the um, landowner is donating uh, an easement out of the goodness of their heart because it's their vision of the property and that's how they want their property be to, to be preserved. 
purchase easement is when they get a um, incentive to do so. Uh, I will talk about different easement types in later slides um, to give you more of an idea of the different differences between the programs. Um, another way to think about easements is um, the bundle of rights um, and metaphor. So imagine yourself with a bundle of sticks in your hands and those are all the rights granted to you in owning the property. What an easement does is just remove a couple of those rights from the bundle um, to be held by the easement holder or another program where um, they are able to preserve the property in perpetuity, monitor it, and determine some allowances and restrictions as um, negotiated with the program and or the landowner. So at the end of the day, the landowner still owns the land. There's just certain rights out of that bundle of sticks that they are um, uh, conserving. So here is the um, map of Harford County with the development and vulnerability as done by the Chesapeake Bay program. Um, this is through 2055 with our current zoning. So this is a heat sensory map. So you can see in the more densely populated areas, it's a darker red. Um, in the lesser uh, populated areas, it's more of that um, neutral background. So this is important to um, recognize because we need to know what the opportunities are to target properties for conservation easements. Harford County consists of approximately 281,000 acres in total. And when we remove uh, the acres um, that are already preserved through programs like Aberdeen Proving Ground, um, areas that are within the development envelope because it is assumed that um, those areas will be developed as opposed to preserved, um, non-agricultural zoned or developed agricultural zone lands, government owned parcels such as pool, parks, schools, um, and other open spaces, acres that are already conserved under a conservation easement and forever preserved, and then as well acres that have deed of restrictions, which is um, uh, similar to a conservation easement, but it does not meet the easement criteria in all aspects. So once those different types of uh, acres are subtracted from the total available in all of Harford County, we really only have a little over 20,000 acres that we could target for conservation easements, which is mind boggling when you think of we're starting with nearly 300,000 acres. So what are the different types of programs that you as Harford County residents could enroll in? Um, so, um, I have here the different programs, the year that they uh, were either founded or um, created, and the current number of acres that that program is preserving. So we have the Maryland Environmental Trust, which is part of the Maryland Department of Natural Resources, founded in, or, um, created in 1977, and they currently um, have over 3,000 acres uh, in conservation easements. The Maryland Agricultural Land Preservation Foundation Easement Program, uh, shorthand you may have heard of is MALF, created the same year and with approximately 16,000 acres conserved. The Harford County Land Preservation District Program um, is modeled off of the state program, um, created in 1992 and has nearly 2,000 acres uh, conserved. Um, the Harford County Land Preservation Easement Program is a similar program uh, with 35,000 acres conserved. The Maryland Department of Natural Resources Rural Legacy Program um, this is a program where there are certain areas within each county, some counties have more than one area that is targeted for its ecological and natural resource um, benefits and the state of Maryland is incentivizing folks in those areas to conserve um, their resources by considering a conservation easement. And then other programs uh, include forest legacy programs, farm and ranch protections, Maryland historic trusts, uh, armed Forces Easement Buffer Program, and local land trusts such as Harford Land Trust. So um, the basics are pretty similar from all of these different programs when um, determining uh, the easement processing. So you can see on the right hand side, um, the deadline application dates for the programs that I've listed, as well as the settlement, time, settlement timelines. You can see, um, that some have a rolling deadline, some have uh, definitive dates, and you can also tell that um, you know, most programs are probably at least a year commitment, if not 
two years or more. Um, but with any easement, as with any process, you have to start somewhere. So we typically start on the land trust side with um, learning about the opportunity, consulting with the landowner and meeting with them to determine which program best suits their needs and helping them apply for it. Um, we do a property visit to calculate and identify the conservation values of that property, whether it's um, you know, public benefit, wildlife benefit, um, water quality benefits and um, uh, other benefits to the uh, <clears throat> surrounding uh, contiguous uh, conservation of other properties. We will do our research and review if this uh, conservation would be in alignment with other municipal and governmental uh, policies, um, such as uh, those goals that I was talking about earlier of preserving approximately 22,000 uh, conservation uh, areas, um, going through the terms and conditions of the easement with the landowner, making sure that they understand the legalese of it as Craig mentioned, you know, sometimes people get stuck in the jargon of their profession and it can be difficult to understand exactly what a term means in the context of a conservation easement um, deed. We also discuss the valuation and or um, offer to the landowner if applicable and determine their rate of acceptance into the program or um, the other easement uh, opportunities. Then there is subordination with any um, easement because it stays with the land as opposed to with the owner any other kinds of liens or easements or mortgages need to subordinate to the easement um, because the last thing you want is for whatever reason if you were to have to foreclose on the property um, then the if the easement is not the um, overall ruling factor the um, there could be an opportunity that would not be preserved in perpetuity and that's not the goal of this so once that's done, there's the approval of all the documents, settlement and recordation. So these do get recorded in the land records. And again, if it were to be inherited by others or um, resold through the real property, real estate, um, the next landowner would get a copy of these papers and saying that your property is under an easement and there are certain allowances and restrictions that you should consider um, when managing your property. So I'm gonna go real quick through um, the various programs that I've talked about. I just kind of wanna show at a very basic level, the differences between all of them in case anyone on this phone call is considering um, entering into an easement program. These first few that I'm gonna go through are um, uh, led or, or, or overseen by uh, Harford County Planning and Zoning, um, gentleman named by Bill Amos. Um, if anyone is interested in these programs, feel free to contact me afterwards and I can introduce and make the connection um, to Bill. And then the last one is going to be about Hartford Land Trust. So the first one we have is the MALF program. Um, eligible criteria includes that it's zoned agricultural. You have at least one development right. That means that if you have a property or a parcel and um, you have a home on it, that is one development right, right? Because you can build a primary dwelling. And then any additional property rights after additional development rights after that meaning you can have, depending on your zoning, you could have anywhere between one to maybe 20 additional um, uh, uh, development rights on the property. And so that makes it really enticing uh, to enter these programs because if you only have the one development right and it's extinguished by the fact that you have a primary dwelling um, in the big picture, uh, most people or most organizations consider that property to effectively be preserved anyway, because there's no potential for um, more development because it literally cannot be developed more because it doesn't have any more development rights. So um, this program also requires a minimum of 50 acres or contiguous um, located contiguously to an easement property um, and that there's a minimum of 50% of class one, two or three soils present on the property. Uh, the pricing basis is an approval minus the agricultural value. This is determined by a formula that calculates the land rent based on the soil productivity. And it's typically capped at 75% of the fair market value. The average price per acres in terms is about $6,500 per acre. Um, and the grantor is able to choose whether it's a lump sum payment or installment payments over two to 10 years. 
the average price per acre is approximately, um, uh, let's see here, um, is typically, uh, I think, 6,500 per acre. And then the tax benefit um, is a county tax credit of about $50 per acre. So next one is the Harford County version. Uh, again, it has many of the same criteria as you see for the eligibility and the pricing basis is the same uh, with the difference that it's either $6,500 per acre or $100,000 per extra development right, whichever cost is lower. Um, it has a slightly lower uh, average cost per or average price per acre and it has the same um, tax benefit. These are the rural legacy programs that are available in Hartford County. Um, as you can see, the Manor uh, Conservancy is over by the Baltimore and Hartford County line near Jarrettsville and uh, Whitehall area. And Deer Creek is essentially almost the entirety of the Deer Creek uh, watershed uh, seen here in purple. So again, it needs to, the property, if you're considering uh, Deer Creek or Manor Conservancy Legacy Program, need to have at least one additional development right zoned agricultural. Um, the pricing is based off a of formula and the average price per acre varies from about $5,000 to $5,500 per acre. And again, the county tax is about $50 per acre. Now we get into donated easements. So someone may ask, why do a donated easement when you can have these other incentive programs? And the answer is, that typically the property is not eligible or does not high or score highly enough for one of the purchase easement programs. As you can as you can tell, a lot of those programs had uh, higher minimums for the number of acres that the parcel needed to be. So this program typically um, focuses on the smaller parcels of about 20 acres or so. Um, it also has uh, this program of a donated easement also has the potential tax benefits um, provided by donating a conservation easement may be more advantageous than just a direct payment to the landowner. And the terms of the conservation easement for one, um, for one of the purchase easement programs may not suit the long-term needs or the desires of the landowner. Um, another benefit to this is that this can be a little bit more tailored to the landowner's vision for the property. Um, as opposed to when entering into one of the other previous programs that I mentioned, it kind of follows along what the program dictates. So some of the things that we consider as Hartford Land Trust um, when we partner with Maryland Environmental Trust or when we look at a parcel um, on, our, on our own is whether or not the landowner um, insists on having provisions in the easement, which would seriously diminish the property's primary conservation value. So if this is a property that is heavily forested and has great wildlife habitat and has this really um, niche um, area where species can really thrive and their vision for the property is for it to be a paintball course for their uh, extended family member, that does diminish over time um, the conservation values, right? Because you have all the paintball, um, the residue and leftovers that will eventually biodegrade, but not for some time. You can have a parking issue if you're having people come over and um, run off from the parking. Um, so it's stuff like that that we consider. We also consider whether the property is of sufficient size so that it's likely to remain intact with adjacent properties if they're developed. So again, you know, if the property um, is uh, kind of not contiguous with other conserved areas and it's of a small um, parcel uh, acreage, it, the likelihood that it'll eventually be developed or not be able to withstand development pressure is higher than if it's a larger parcel. Um, uh, we determine whether the property is part of a larger conservation plan for the community or region. Again, is it a standalone opportunity or do we have the opportunity to maximize a corridor of conserv uh, conserved land? Um, and if the easement would be difficult to enforce and require extensive management. So if um, the current landowners are really conservation minded, but their successors who they have um, requested take ownership of the property really aren't, um, that's something to consider as well as if the property is already under extensive invasive species um, uh, degradation or any other kind of um, high uh, staff time or high resource uh, devoted to the management, that's something that we take into consideration as well. 
So MET and HLT use a model to determine uh, the terms of the easement. However, some of the terms are negotiable, like I mentioned before. Um, and then we also have uh, different in benefits for both your federal income tax, state income tax, and property credit tax, tax credit. So the value of the donation for your federal tax income is determined by an appraisal. So if the value is 50% or less of the landowner's adjusted gross income, it may be entirely deducted in one year. If the value is greater, it may be spread over as many as 15 years. For your state income tax, donations of a conservation easement result in a minimum state tax credit per individual or per pass-through entity of $5,000 per year. And finally, for your property tax credit, a landowner may pay no property tax for 15 years from the date of the donation. So again, uh, you're donating the easement, but there are some uh, incentives that um, are worth considering as well. So again, just to go through this process, uh, because I would like to show you guys a real world example of what we kind of look at. You first, you learn about the opportunity, consult with the landowner, visit the property, do your research, help define terms, value the properties to see which um, you know offer you can you can give and the likelihood of acceptance. Make sure your paperwork is in order for subordination approval and sediment and then finally record it in the land records for the county. So here is an example. A landowner comes to Hartford Land Trust. They own both parcels and say, hey, um, you know, I'm, I'm getting up in my years. My children don't want the property. I have this emotional attachment to it and I really don't feel comfortable um, selling it on the market um, without some sort of protection because I want it to stay as it is for um, essentially forever. I don't want it to be developed. I don't want it to have utility lines going through it. So I'm interested, but I also, because of the size of my property, um, I don't really qualify for any of the bigger agricultural programs. And because I'm not um, located in any of the rural legacy programs, um, I'm not really eligible for that either. So I'm coming to you, Hartford Land Trust. Um, what do you think? So um, we do our research. We can see that she, you know, has about 20 or 30 acres here of both mixed uses of open space in uh, this section down here, agricultural up here, and then the rest of it is forested. Right here is a bit of a development area where she's got her primary dwelling and then kind of like an in-law cottage suite here near the road. Um, it's difficult to tell on this aerial map because it's leaf on, but there's also a tributary here to um, uh, the nearest, uh, I think it's a tributary to Deer Creek, um, if I'm not mistaken. So what we do is we go out on the site, we take pictures. It looks like from an initial standpoint that yes, the forest is in good condition. The stream shows uh, typical signs of erosion for the area and um, the agricultural field is well maintained and, and looks like it's doing best managed practices. So yes, we are interested. So then we talk to the landowner, we were, you know, letting them know, hey, we require um, that you maintain or that it is maintained to have a stream buffer. That's not a problem. I love the stream and I wish it would continue that way. Great. Um, we are generally gonna prohibit any further subdivision. They say, awesome, I want my property to stay together regardless of what other surrounding parcels may um, do with their properties. Uh, we, re we request that um, no additional homes be uh, um, erected and built, but we do say if for whatever reason in the future, this home here is no longer suitable for dwelling and the landowner wants to tear down the house and uh, uh, build one somewhere else, then we decide, okay, how do we limit where the development is? Do we say that it's only within the existing footprint or do we, or are you comfortable landowner with having the house be maybe somewhere up here in the agricultural area? What would you like to see? And the way we can do that is either by doing something inclusive where you could say like, okay, in this smaller parcel, anything within this smaller parcel, you can put the house, you can do an extra development or you can rebuild um, with the existing footprint. Um, or you could do something exclusive, which says anything outside of this forested area could be in the development because we don't want 
uh, the forest to be impacted at all. So this particular landowner said, I would like it to stay on the smaller parcel and they can pick uh, where they wanna build the house. I said, great. For agricultural uses, are there any limitations? Um, and she said, you know what? I really don't want any CAFO, so confined animal feeding operations on this property. She, and um, we said, okay, let's look at it. And we determined by looking at where we thought the most likely um, feasible area somewhere up here in the existing ag footprint that a CAFO could be um, uh, installed, we, were, we determined that there wasn't enough acreage for it and with through the lens of determining if it would diminish the conservation values rather than any sort of ethical or moral consideration, we determined that it would in fact diminish the um, conservation values so we would find language to not have that be an allowance in this easement. Um, other things to consider are timbering, as uh, Craig went over in detail before. We do allow timbering, but under the supervision um, and management of a forward stewardship plan, you're also allowed to do ecosystem marketing with these properties, and we require a buffer. You know, other things that they can determine is whether or not they will give up right of easements to other landowners. Um, so it really is a back and forth dialogue as to what works best for the landowner's current vision for the property and what they hope you know, it will be in the future years to come. And lastly, I wanna show you that what we also take into consideration is what are the surrounding uh, protected lands look like? So anything here, any parcel that is white on this map shows that it has been preserved through any number of programs. So as you can see, adding these two parcels here under conservation would just be in line with what's already going on in the area. So again, that's something positive and beneficial that we like to look for in these types of projects. So I know I went through that pretty quickly. Um, as always, if you have any questions about uh, conservation easements, the programs I talked about tonight or uh, any of the county programs, please, please feel free to get in touch with me and I can get you in touch with the county or um, get in touch with Hartford Land Trust to get more information. Um, uh, we are happy to help the public and we, we really truly believe um, in having this connection to the land and that um, you know, the, the future is only brighter when land is preserved and available for all those to enjoy it. So just again, real quick, if you need Craig's information, it's right here. I'm also happy to, with his permission, give it out to anyone who asks for it. Um, our executive director, Kristen Kirkwood, couldn't make it tonight. Um, that is her information if you have a question specifically, um, either about an easement that you currently have or want to talk about land acquisitions. And I am always available to talk and, and get the resources to you that you may need. So um, with that, Craig, if you have anything more to add, I am happy to let you do so. Oh, no, no, thanks for attending. All right, guys, thank you very much. Um, we really appreciate you guys attending this Woodland Workshop series. Um, Hartford Land Trust is happy to put on future events like this. So if you are an organization that you are a part of have similar kind of um, educational components that have to do with um, you know, the betterment of the community through land preservation or best management practices or any kind of forestry stream, water quality, any of that kind of stuff, we are happy to, to do any kind of partnership. So. Thank you very much for giving us your time this evening. Um, I, like I said before, I will be sending out an email, uh, hopefully tomorrow at some point with this recording, as well as um, any other in, uh, additional information that we feel we may need. Um, and if there's something you'd like to know more about, please, please reach out to us, we're happy to help. But otherwise, thank you very much for coming. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Yes, thank you, everybody. Thank you.